Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danette Howard. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Lumina Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Equity First Conversation. It's my pleasure to introduce Julian Castro, who was a presidential candidate during the 2020 election cycle and served as the 16th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in President Barack Obama's administration. Secretary Castro also served as mayor of San Antonio, Texas from 2009 to 2014, and prior to that as a city council member. Please join me, join me, join me in welcoming to our virtual stage, Secretary Julian Castro. Good afternoon, Secretary Castro. How are you today? I'm doing great. Great to be with you, Dr. Howard. It's a pleasure. So before we get into our interview questions, I have to ask you what your intro song was and why you chose that song. Uh, that song uh, is Baila Esta Cumbia by Selena. Uh, and so Selena, of course, was a tremendously popular Tejano singer when I was growing up in the 1990s in South Texas. Uh, and so uh, when I ran for president, actually, that was the song that we used as a walk-on song. Uh, just a catchy song that people can dance to and one that reminded me of growing up. Uh, and, uh, you know, also uh, I was aware that if I were elected, I would become the first uh, Latino elected president. And so um, I wanted to select a song that sort of without beating people over the head with it would say, you know, this is something new, this is something different. You should have seen when we ran that song, you know, in Iowa, in the middle of all the <laughs> cornfields and uh, different audiences that had never heard it. Uh, it was neat to see people kind of get up and dance to it and stuff. So thank you for, for playing it. Uh, I was joking earlier that uh, it makes me feel like we're in 2019 again. <laughs> Absolutely. So you and I are fellow Gen Xers. So uh, growing up in the 90s, also a huge Selena fan. So we're going to dive right in. I have so many questions for you today. Uh, many of them are based on your memoir, An Unlikely Journey. And I shared with you earlier, I love the book. I'm so glad that you wrote it. Uh, and in the book, you discuss um, your upbringing and being raised by your mom and your grandmother, whom you affectionately refer to as Mamo. Um, to get us started, can you begin by sharing a little bit about your childhood and your family? Yeah, you know, I have a twin brother, Joaquin. Uh, Joaquin represents the 20th Congressional District. Both of us, fortunately or unfortunately, chose to go into politics. Um, but he and I grew up with my mother and my grandmother on the west side of San Antonio. And my grandmother had come over to the United States in 1922 when she was about six or seven years old uh, because her parents passed away. They lived in northern Mexico and her nearest relatives lived in San Antonio. So they brought her over to San Antonio. Uh, she grew up there. They pulled her out of, of school when she was still in elementary. And so she never really got a formal education, um, but she taught herself to read and to write in Spanish and English. Um, she worked her entire career as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter, and she brought up my mom as a single parent. Um, my, in fact, Castro is my mom's name. My mother brought us up as a single parent, and it was my grandmother's name before her. Uh, and my mom, um, by the time Joaquin and I came along in 1974, you mentioned that we're Gen Xers, uh, she had already been a Hellraiser. She was part of the Chicano movement of the late 60s and early 70s. She went through uh, 16 straight years of Catholic school education and embraced the social justice part of it. Um, and I think rebelled against the sort of, um, you know, be obedient and stay in your place part of it. Uh, and so, you know, we grew up, I grew up with two strong women that were absolutely determined to make sure that my brother and I could have more opportunity than they had had um, and wanted to fight for that for us and also, especially with my mom, for the larger community. 
That's great. And your mom um, and your grandmother, amazing women. Um, you speak about your mother being an advocate and an activist, and you say that as far back as you can recall. Uh, you remember her being involved in local campaigns, just very politically uh, engaged. And you tell a story about your first campaign actually being when you and your brother convinced your mom to allow you to change schools. So all of that political engagement definitely rubbed off on you um, at an early age. But speaking of your twin brother, um, Congressman Castro, uh, you write in your book that uh, as youngsters, you all were very competitive. Uh, I guess as most siblings are, there was this sibling rivalry and you were always competing for who got the best grades and things like that. And there was this humbling moment in elementary school where you were just convinced that you were going to be the, the winner of the, the third grade math uh, experience or what have you, and your brother beat you out. Uh, but at some point, that sibling rivalry kind of turned into you being each other's uh, biggest advocates. And that has shown itself in your political campaigns as you've supported each other over the years, but also uh, in different aspects of your lives. So can you talk a little bit about that transition between you and your brother? Yeah, you know, um, there are a lot of people that are super close to their siblings, but like I'm convinced that being a twin is like on another level. And uh, in so many ways, it's it, the, the bond that you have is special um, for good and sometimes for bad. When we were growing up, we were so competitive, uh, like you mentioned, and I wrote about in the book, um, when we played sports. I mean, we used to, our tennis coach at one point when we were playing in high school, didn't let us play against each other anymore because we would yell at each other. And I think he and I broke a couple of rackets between us. Um, but we also, you know, helped propel each other uh, because we were so competitive to do better in school and to reach higher, you know, to do as well as we could. Um, I think like anything, when you grow up, just like your relationship with your parents changes, that your relationship often with your siblings change. And that was the case for Joaquin and me. I and mean, we went from being super competitive to being very supportive of one another. Um, and I think what helped is that, you know, we each, as you grow up, you each more and more, you have your own identity. There's so much that is tied into people feeling secure in their identity. And I think for me and for Joaquin, that was especially true because when you're a twin, the world often packages you mm -hmm. and like people refer to you as a unit and they see you the same way. You walk through the world and you're treated the same way. And so we had to grow up a little bit and feel you know more secure in ourselves and as individuals even though we're both in politics and we went to the same schools and all of that, um, uh, it really helped that, that we started to have our own identity. And when I ran for the first time for city council, 20 years ago, actually, this year, uh, he was my campaign manager and then I served in that role for him. And uh, I remember when I lost my first mayor's race in San Antonio, you know, he and I were not, have not generally been very expressive you know, hugging each other or, or saying how much we care about one another. I think we know that, but like a lot of guys, you know, we don't express that probably as much as we should. But uh, about a week after I lost, he got me this book. And the book was, like, it was the equivalent of one of those things, like, you know, that series, like the how-to for dummies. Um, but it was like how to become president. And it was this sort of spoof book about if you became president, what the Oval Office is like and where to find the restroom and, you know, like almost a joke, but I took in that like a, a, a sign of, of love and of encouragement saying, hey, don't give up because you have a bright future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, like a lot of siblings, we found our ways to support one another um, in big ways and small ways. Yes, that's great. And, and you both have reached um, very high levels of achievement in your political career. And I um, read that when you were announced as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, there's a little note in the program that said you were um, the identical twins that had ascended uh, the furthest in terms of public service and public life. So as you, you think about the roles that both you and your brother have assumed, 
How do you reflect on those early influences of your mom's, her advocacy and her activism, her working on local campaigns, even if they weren't successful, but making that you know, gradual progress? How do you think about the influence of those lessons on your life today? I mean, I wouldn't be in public service. Um, I don't think I would have gone down the path that I went down if it weren't for my mom. Um, uh, in so many different ways. Number one, that she was just a wonderful, loving mother. Um, as busy as she was, as, as involved as she was in the community, I never felt for a second that me or my brother were ever second place. I mean, she just did a, a Herculean job, superwoman job of making us feel like um, we had all of her time and her attention and that we came first. Um, but then also, she provided this foundation for us, this worldview of what should be, of, of right and wrong. And also, and this is where I think that going into politics comes into place, the sense that you should always find a way to do something more than just for yourself, or even for yourself and your family, that you should use your time and your, your intelligence and your energy to also do something for other people. And that if you don't do that, that you're really not fulfilling your, your full potential. And um, that's what I try to take with me. I mean, that's what I took with me when I decided to get into politics. And even when I've been out of it, you know, um, figuring out ways to uh, volunteer or, you know, be supportive of those who are uh, running for office or just other ways to contribute. Thank you for sharing that, that's, that's excellent. So you spoke um, earlier about um, your grandmother's journey um, and you know, your mother's experiences. And you say that um, in retrospect, you said this in the book, in retrospect, your family's story feels like a lab experiment in the difference in education can make. So that resonated um, with me uh, because of the work that we do at Lumina Foundation, which is all about ensuring that more people have the opportunities to pursue learning beyond high school. So can you reflect a little bit on that statement? It feels like um, your family is a lab experiment in the difference that an education can make. Yeah, I mean, I saw that firsthand with my grandmother and how limiting it was for her that she didn't have a formal education. Now, I mean, there's no question that for um, women like her and many others, uh, black and brown women that at that time there were so many other limits even if you did have a, an education but especially if you didn't um, the fact that she worked as a maid a cook and a babysitter um, and then I saw with my mom who was able to graduate from high school and then actually go on to college and then go on and get a master's degree too when my brother and I were like eight nine years old uh, you know we I remember her taking us with her to the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, she got her master's degree, I think, in environmental science. And um, seeing the difference that that made in her life uh, and, and wanting to make sure that we got well-educated. So just in my own family, I've seen that. I've also seen that in my peers. Uh, I mean, I went to, Joaquin and I went to public schools our entire life until we went to college. And I saw folks who got an opportunity to go into good higher education and the difference that that made since then in their lives. And I saw a lot of folks who at the time in high school, I thought also had the talent, the ability, but for different reasons did not end up in higher education. And, and that made a real difference too. And I, and I actually wanted to um, transition into asking you a question about that because you know, you made very clear that your mom drilled into your heads from a very early age that you were going to go to college. You went to summer programs, you had all sorts of exposure, and uh, you graduated from high school a year early, both you and your brother, and went on to Stanford. But when you got on the campus of Stanford after leaving um, San Antonio, where you had lived all of your life, um, you said, uh, you say nobody could look at the routes taken to Stanford and say that they were equitable. So almost immediately you realize that your classmates had been exposed to things and had access to things that you didn't. 
Um, you talk about going to Stanford and, and never having seen a computer mouse before, not knowing how that worked. Um, you took two AP classes while your classmates, uh, some of them took 12 AP classes. I don't even know if there were that many um, offered at your high school. So you became um, very aware of the inequities in the pathway uh, and then how that played out. Uh, in some ways you had to play catch up, you had to have extra supports. Can you say a little bit about that? Because we are still seeing those inequities very much uh, at play today. And as we think about where we find ourselves at this moment, uh, some of the inequities that have been amplified as we have uh, dealt with co the COVID-19 pandemic, um, what are your thoughts on these inequitable pathways and what we need to do to redesign the system to make sure that more people, more students have a fairer journey into post-secondary education? Yeah, closing those gaps uh, in terms of equity are so important to student success, really to our society's success in the years to come. There's no question that this last 14, 15 months of the, pan 14 months of the pandemic have put a spotlight on how deep those inequities go. Mm -hmm. And for Joaquin and me, we grew up in two school districts, the Edgewood Independent School District and the San Antonio Independent School District that had been at the heart of a 1973 Supreme Court case called SAISD versus Rodriguez. And parents from the Edgewood School District had sued the state of Texas because of the way that it financed schools. And basically there were property poor schools and property rich schools. Eventually in 73, the Supreme Court said that not only was educational, education not a fundamental right, but it upheld the way that Texas financed its schools. In 1989, the Texas Supreme Court finally went in and tried to ameliorate that. But even now, Texas, New Jersey, a number of other states, there's still a fight about whether school financing is equitable. What that meant for us is many of the things I talked about in my book and that you just mentioned, you know, less AP classes than most of the people that we found ourselves classmates with at Stanford, uh, the resources that were available to us, whether it was, uh, you know, the latest computers or a whole bunch of other stuff, just you know, compared to other places, they, it wasn't there, uh, the, the level of education that we got. Um, so to me, that was a lesson in, for institutions of higher education, how mindful they ought to be. If we really take an equity lens to uh, establishing programs and uh, curricula and resources at universities, you have to be mindful of where people are coming from. And, um, you know, Stanford was probably better than most because they had a diverse population and still do. And they also had the resources. It's even tougher, tougher at these institutions that don't have the same level of resources. Um, but it's absolutely necessary the whole way through from pre-K uh, all the way through higher education to take an equity lens uh, to how we deliver curriculum and programming and resources. And, you know, Secretary Castro, you've um, dealt with a lot of issues over your career, but education has always been incredibly um, important to you and, and a focus of your work. Um, I, I want to read a quote, and then I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you say that this inequity in our country's education system has never stopped seeming like one of our most chronic problems. It's painful to think of a kid forced to swim upstream only to arrive at the same spot as somebody who had the opportunity placed in front of him. Sure, both kids have to achieve, but the effort and available support and resources are often incomparable. So as I read that uh, statement and thought about some of the um, areas that you focused on, pre-K for all in San Antonio, um, the College Cafe, which is something that um, we supported at Lumina, uh, which was in response to um, the college counselor to student ratio in San Antonio, which was something like one for every 420 students. So can you speak a little bit about some of the efforts that you've supported over the years as education has been a main priority area for you? 
Yeah, you know, when I got to Stanford, I had a chance to see my home community for the first time through an outsider's eyes mm. and to recognize a lot of great stuff about San Antonio. And anybody who's visited San Antonio knows how warm it is and you know, it really is a special place. Um, but I also saw higher education levels, higher income levels, uh, greater preparedness for the future there in the Bay Area generally. And then, of course, at Stanford compared to what I had seen um, growing up. And so I kind of had a chip on my shoulder about my hometown mm -hmm. and, and people who had grown up the way that I did, especially. And I, you know, I always believed like so many do. And, and also, you know, I think this is what underpins luminous work is that you're closing those equity gaps and making sure that every single person is able to get an excellent educational opportunity or experience is fundamental to ensuring a more just society. Uh, and so from the very beginning, when I decided to go into public service, I wanted to focus a lot on education. And that's why we ran a ballot initiative, which was the first time that I think a Texas city had done uh, a ballot initiative for pre-K education called Pre-K for SA. We raised successfully raised the sales tax to fund it. We started Cafe College because that student to counselor ratio was so out of line. Um, so I just, I went about thinking about my own experience and then the experience of other people that I knew and had grown up with and tried to plug those gaps, you know, one by one. And um, there's so much more work to be done though, but I'm very proud that uh, Cafe College just celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. The end of last year and pre-k for sa is i think entering its seventh or eighth year and so far uh when these students that first cohort second cohort went through their third grade testing they did significantly better than um, similarly situated students in the community and even across the country so i'm proud that in our own small way we started to help plug those gaps that's fantastic and and something that um I know you've reflected on quite a bit is um, this approach that you've taken, which allows issues that benefit a certain population or a specific population to be presented in a way where everyone really um, sees the benefits that they experience reflected in a particular initiative or intervention. And um, you know, you talk about why it's important for um, us not to have a zero sum mentality, right? Even though there might be a targeted intervention, it really does benefit everyone. And I think this is so important specifically as we think about um, racial equity and focusing on race and ethnicity, because we do have to address some of those unfair outcomes that we see in attainment rates, in completion rates. So what have you learned over your career, Secretary Castro, about framing issues and presenting issues in a way that meets the desired outcomes for specific, specific populations, but are presented such that everyone sees the benefit even for themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. I've always, in my time in public service, I always tried to do that. I mean, number one, I don't think that we can ever back off uh, investing in resources and policies that specifically benefit uh, underserved, historically disadvantaged communities, black and brown communities, Native American communities, Asian American communities. Um, you know, at the same time, we know just as a practical matter that um, there's, there's a whole uh, other side of politics that tries to uh, pigeonhole and misrepresent the aims of any kind of initiatives that are, you know, that, that are specifically tailored to provide equity. And so you have to make sure that if you wanna get something passed oftentimes, um, that you do it by showing everyone how they're gonna benefit from something. For instance, when we were doing pre-K for SA in San Antonio, of course I knew that the biggest beneficiaries would be low-income children in the city that are predominantly uh, Latina, Latino, and then African American in San Antonio. Um, but, and, and we talked about that, but really we focused on it as this is also going to create the kind of uh, well educated citizenry that we need in 21st century 
uh, in a 21st century competition for jobs. And so to the extent that we educate our young people, we're going to be able to both grow our business and, and have more investment in San Antonio that's going to benefit everybody because you know, you know all these kids are well educated and that if we don't do that, we're going to lose out on opportunity to whether it's Austin or Denver or any number of other places. And so, um, you know, this is something that I had a thesis advisor at Stanford, uh, Professor Lee Spaga, uh, who is now at Notre Dame, that wrote about the informed public interest. And the idea being this, essentially, that how do you couch policy in a way that doesn't just address your own concerns, but also addresses the wants and needs and concerns of people that might not agree with you. And so I've tried to incorporate that approach, um, whether we were doing pre-K for SA or Connect Home and HUD or any number of other things. Mm -hmm. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. I, I think that's something that um, many people grapple with um, and struggle with because we do need these targeted efforts but we need more people to buy into and to be supportive of these efforts. And so I think your framing is, is really helpful. And I'm glad that you mentioned um, Professor um, uh, Luis Varga, who was one of your mentors um, and really did um, open your eyes to different ways of thinking about your home city, uh, but also about uh, engaging in uh, advocacy efforts and in, I think it was urban um, pol and political studies or something like that was a class that he taught and really got you engaged in all of those issues. And so we think a lot about the intentional experiences that students need to have that lead to their success. One of those experiences is having an adult uh, in their life, particularly when they are in college, who takes them on and ensures that they are going to be successful, who gives them um, that exposure. But we know for, that for far too many students, um, that doesn't happen. If it does happen, it's often by uh, chance or luck and not by design. And I often say that luck isn't a strategy. So this goes back to my earlier point, Secretary Castro, um, which is how can we redesign the higher education experience so that opportunities like the one that you had with your mentor are actually baked into the experience and aren't by uh, happenstance, particularly um, at those institutions uh, where we know many um, black and brown students are attending. You, you mentioned community colleges, you mentioned regional comprehensive institutions, uh, minority serving institutions, HSIs and HBCUs that are not as well funded as places like Stanford. How do we need to think about making sure that those experiences can be commonplace at all institutions? I, you know, I, I think that there's so much work that has to go into that. I mean, everything from um, creating a welcoming environment, making students feel as comfortable as possible and uh, curriculum, programming that that is culturally competent and resonant mm -hmm. to uh, the diversity of faculty. I mean, we know that in way too many institutions of higher education still, uh, they're, they're woefully lacking in faculty diversity. Uh, and also uh, to making that, to, to, I guess, bringing down the barriers for engagement as much as possible. I'll give you a very quick example of that. Uh, the first thing I really ever ran for was with my brother <laughs> about uh, 26 years ago in 1995, we ran for the Stanford Student Senate together. Uh, we actually ended up tying for first place with 811 votes. So we haven't settled who's the better politician yet. Right. But one of the things that I remember back then we called for was recommendation hours. You know how you have office hours uh, with professors, but so many people are afraid to go to office hours. Like, and especially if you're coming from a background where you sort of already kind of have your head down and you're not used to this, to go into the office hours of a professor, you know, and try and establish that relationship. It's just, so our idea was that you would explicitly have this time where professors would, you would meet with professors for 
the purpose of establishing that kind of relationship and especially geared toward them being able to recommend you for fellowships or eventually for graduate school for whatever it is but the idea was to bring down that barrier that psychological barrier that often exists in the student and is unfortunately often strengthened by sometimes the disposition or the outlook or just the structure of things at these institutions of higher education. And so if, if I were a university administrator, I would think about these traditional structures we have in place and, and how do you bring those barriers down um, to make them more comfortable to engage with for communities that are not used to, you know, frankly, especially at that age, you know, not used to dealing with somebody on a, a, like an even level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe people have a different experience, but what I noticed about a lot of the black and brown students that we went to college with, and even to law school with, people did not feel entitled to be there. Mm -hmm. They did not feel like, oh, I'm the king of this castle, and you know, if I wanna go, meet with this professor, they better be there to meet with me. They were more, you know, like, um, you know, I don't wanna say intimidated, but I would say reluctant sometimes. Well, we need to zero in in higher education on that and smart, both small ways and bigger ways that you can break those barriers down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I said before, Secretary Castro, if you ever want um, a different career option other than politics, I think you'd be great in higher education because so many of the things that you thought a lot about are the things that we're still trying to figure out today. Um, so thank you for sharing that perspective. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the initiatives that you led when you were Secretary of HUD. And uh, in some cases, I think that you too were ahead of your time as you thought about the importance of ensuring that every family had access to uh, wireless internet. Uh, we're seeing this now become a major issue as the pandemic has forced everyone to work and learn from home. Uh, you know, if you have more than one um, child in school and you're trying to work and, and you don't have internet capacity, well, just imagine how impossible that is. So during your tenure as secretary, you worked hard to make sure that low-income families, ham families in public housing, uh, and others were able to um, have what we all know is necessary now, and that is that internet access. Can you speak about that, and how has your, how has your thinking on that evolved as we found ourselves in this pandemic and really needing to do everything from home? Yeah, you know, when I um, became housing secretary, uh, I wanted to see what we could do to go outside the bounds of just the bricks and mortar. You know, obviously the bricks and mortar are our first priority to create more housing for walls around people. But the way that I saw it was sort of this, this solar system. I wanted resources that would um, you know, revolve around families, almost like they were the sun and the planets were, whether it was internet access or access to better healthcare or better educational opportunity or you know, job opportunities. And one of the big gaps there, of course, was broadband. We found that, that uh, the vast majority of children living in public housing did not have access to the internet at home. And as many people have pointed out, I mean, it's not a luxury anymore. It's a necessity. The way homework is given out, the homework gap, that uh, develops uh, for parents even applying for a job these days, you gotta do it online or it's a lot easier if you're doing it online. And so we were able to strike up a, a partnership, a public private partnership with internet service providers, housing authorities, nonprofits and HUD uh, as a pilot program in 28 communities to do Connect Home. And now you know, thousands, tens of thousands of families at least maybe more than that by now, uh, have availed themselves of that. Uh, during this pandemic, like everybody, I've seen just how urgent it is that we make sure everybody has broadband access at home. And this is another one where I think that everybody can win. 
All right, there's money that's being dedicated, I think, already in the American Rescue Plan or certainly in the infrastructure proposal that President Biden is putting out for connectivity in rural areas. Uh, those rural areas, they're white, but, you know, they're also black in a lot of states, some places they're uh, Latino or Latina. Um, but then also in these urban communities where they're like islands of, of um lack of service. So, you know, there are ways that we can make sure that everybody is able to win. The goal should be to connect everybody in this country the way that we connected everyone to electricity decades ago. And the entire nation benefited from that. I mean, that's the scale that we need to be thinking on. And I guess my thinking has evolved um, to think of it in those terms and also in this moment what i feel like is that there are more americans that are willing to make those type of big investments than we've seen in a very long time because we've all gone through this pandemic and yeah we've had the fights about the mass or no mass um but but more people than when we started this thing feel like you know what we actually do need government um we do have these inequities and you know there are ways that i could be supportive of making investments to close these gaps uh, and that offers an opportunity for our political leaders to get good things done yeah that's right and you know the, the pandemic has been horrific on so many fronts but one of the things that i've taken from this is that during this pandemic we've somehow found a way to get students and learners and just more people generally what they need. So we found a way to get a laptop in nearly every student's hand so they could learn from home. We found a way to um, get a high speed broadband uh, connectivity into more households. Um, we even found a way to make sure that more people had the um, the food that they need. I just got a, a message today that um, public schools will extend free lunch for all students through the end of 2022. So if we were able to find a way to do these things during the pandemic, um, Secretary Castro, how should we be thinking about um, extending some of these, not just during pandemic times, but during all times? And are there other things that we've been able to figure out during the pandemic that we need to think about um, continuing? Um, even once we are through this pandemic, in addition to the examples I shared. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot. I'll just start there. Um, the thing, one of the things that we need to get back into big time is uh, investment in scientific research. I mean, we've seen, we've had a front row seat, all of us, too, where you actually put the resources into this, in this case, mostly private sector, but backed by a government guarantee of purchase of these vaccines. Uh, what can happen? Uh, in terms of solving problems quickly and something that does a lot of societal good, well, there's so much to tackle out there. And, you know, I'm proud that then Vice President Biden, now President Biden is working on things like the cancer moonshot and any number of other, other uh, research initiatives that can have a profound impact on the longevity of life, quality of life of people. So that's, that's one thing, but uh, I think what we, we, should learn from the most is all of these inequities that exist and the vulnerable communities that were hit the hardest. We can't leave them out on the sidelines anymore. Mm -hmm. That's costly for all of us. It's costly for them. It's costly for all of us as a country. Uh, I believe that the vision that we have should be that we want everybody to live with dignity. And so what does that look like? To me, that looks like uh, everybody having good health care, uh, everybody being able to get a good education, seeing housing as a human right, um, those things, those basic things that you need to live with dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, um, you know, some people hear that and they think that that's pie in the sky or that's naive, um, but I, I believe that there are countries around the world that have gotten closer in many ways to that. And that is the United States matures as a nation, you know, we, we're still a relatively young nation with divisions that have uh, affected us from the very beginning. 
But as we mature as a nation, I think that that's the, the direction. I certainly hope that's the direction that we're going to go in. And I feel like the experience we've been through has just accelerated uh, our movement toward that. Right. Yes, and we've spoken about um, finding ourselves in the midst of this pandemic, but we've also found ourselves in this moment um, at a time of um, racial reckoning uh, mm -hmm. that this country hasn't experienced in many, many decades, spurred, of course, by the murder of Mr. George Floyd and, and so many others. And um, there was a profile of you um, that was done in Esquire magazine when you were running for president. And I just want to read a quote from that article and then have you respond. Um, it said, a righteous voice in this campaign for people whose voices are truly silent. He spoke their names on a national stage. Philando Castillo, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, Sandra Bland, and the others. Like a sad litany out of a cathedral history. He dared us to say the names too. So, you know, this was even before um, last May when Mr. Floyd was murdered. And today you remain active um, in this fight and regarding this issue. And you have addressed it in your podcast, Our America. So can you share a little bit about what drove you to focus um, on this issue and to acknowledge the lives that have been lost while in police custody during your campaign? And what do you have to say now, even um, after the verdict, when there is still so much uncertainty and unrest in our country regarding this issue? You know, when I ran for president, uh, even though because the campaign never became one of the leading campaigns, this part didn't get as much attention. But I, in just about every stump speech out in Iowa or New Hampshire or other places, I used to say that, that my vision for our country was that we could be the smartest, uh, the healthiest, the fairest, mm. and the most prosperous, and that all of those things went together. And you know, I could see, anybody with two eyes should be able to see um, that when it came to policing, there's such a basic uh, inequality of treatment uh, and an unfairness to it that just personally gets to me, has gotten to me for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and people could probably tell that when I talked about it. Uh, now I would go and talk about this in Iowa, New Hampshire, and you know, I was like, <laughs> well, you know, I was convinced it was flying over the head of half the people that I was talking to. But it was interesting when I went into South Carolina, mm -hmm. when I went into uh, Arizona, for, you know, I actually got the biggest response in the Phoenix area when I would speak about these issues because people have had, black and brown communities have had different experiences with that. Mm -hmm. And um, what I saw was that it wasn't going to go away, you know, that, it, that this was going to keep happening. And so it deserved to be an issue that we put right front and center on the debate stage, on the policy platform to deal with. And too oftentimes it had been like a third rail issue to politicians that didn't want to take on police unions or just thought they couldn't get ahead because you're not law and order enough or whatever reason. But in the meantime, you're getting more Eric Garner's and Philando Castile's and Pamela Turner's and Stefan Clark's and, and everybody that we've seen since then. And all the ones that we've, you know, I just think about all of the ones before there was uh, video cameras. Um, and maybe incidences that weren't as spectacular or deadly, but still people being abused. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that we addressed that. Uh, even though I wasn't successful in getting the nomination, uh, I, I hope that that helped move the conversation forward. And, uh, you know, there, there's only a tragedy that has come from the, the deaths of George Floyd and others since then. But I hope at least a lesson that has been learned is that people can't sweep that under the rug anymore. Like you're gonna have to deal with it. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Secretary Castro, we're getting um, a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to turn to some of those audience questions now, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, first, given your experience in leading housing and urban development, 
How do you think community colleges and housing agencies might partner to better serve adults of color who are or who might want to pursue higher education? That's a, a fantastic uh, question. I mean, here's the thing, at least in my hometown of San Antonio and a lot of the communities that I visited when I was HUD secretary and just since then, uh, oftentimes the institution of higher learning that's located closest to poorest neighborhoods, sometimes in poor neighborhoods, oftentimes is not the grand university, right? But it's these community colleges. And also, of course, uh, community colleges are where most students of color actually end up going and, uh, and public school students in general. So um, they have a tremendous role to play in connecting those young people and the adults with resources. And, and you know, so what can you do? I think outreach to public housing communities and to lower income neighborhoods uh, through established networks, whether it's boys and girls clubs or any number of different community organizations that work in the kind of neighborhoods that I grew up in and many people are growing up in now, uh, forging those bonds, uh, providing an opportunity to demystify higher education. Mm -hmm. Because too often times, so many of our young people still think, oh, well, that's not for me. You know, either I can't afford it or, uh, you know, I don't belong there. Um, and even if they don't say it, what's so unfortunate is that it's almost an internalized self-oppression. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sadness to that, but I think it's true oftentimes mm -hmm. that people write themselves out of it, in addition to all the other actual barriers that are there. So what do we do, right? You got to go to them. Uh, you got to take that as many steps as you can to integrate into the life and the community of those neighborhoods. Um, when it comes to housing, I think integrating information about uh, affordable housing opportunities for your students, uh, for their families, and also, look, uh, if things go the way I think they're going to go with this American Rescue Plan that's already in the books, with the infrastructure plan, higher education institutions are going to be receiving a lot of dollars that, that they didn't anticipate just a couple of years ago. You need to connect the dots of policy. Mm -hmm. Don't do the silos anymore. You need to make sure as you think about, you know, that development that you're going to do, well, what, what role could affordable housing play in that? Mm -hmm. As you do curriculum and programming and so forth, connect all of the dots of policy, transit, education, housing, um, job opportunity, environment and health. Mm -hmm. you know, think about it in those terms. I guess the last thing I would say about this is, if I could have like one, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and have one thing for each community out there to do, it would be that on one day, at least for, I don't know, six hours, that, that the mayor and the county supervisor and the head of the housing authority and the head of the school district and the community college district and the university and the hospital system and the transit system, plus neighborhood residents, all get in a fishbowl in the same room. People can wear their masks and be socially distant or whatever they have to do. But with maps on the wall of the most distressed neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and of course, oftentimes these are gonna be black and brown neighborhoods. And with, with visual representation of the investments that are already made and being made, and the programs that affect those physical geographical areas, and then a conversation amongst themselves as policymakers and with the community about how all of those things can go together. You know, how you can connect those dots, like literally right in front of you in terms of what's coming up or what could be changed, because now you see what else is going on and these policymakers are informed in ways that they hadn't been before. And the community can help you understand what other opportunities there are there. You would think that something like that happens, right, every now and then, but it never happens. Mm. Um, and that's what we tried to do in SA 2020 in San Antonio. Um, but that's what communities can do anywhere. Uh, and I think that that's one simple exercise, but things like that can help unlock initiatives that people wouldn't have dreamed of before. I love that. Breaking down the silos has to be job number one. And I'm also 
um, appreciated what you said about just demystifying higher education. And for us at Lumina Foundation, part of that is uh, re um, acknowledging the important value of the bachelor's degree but also sharing that there are other credentials that are incredibly valuable as well. So the certificate, the industry recognized certification, the associate degree, um, what's most important is that people have a pathway and they have a pathway to something more if they choose to do that. So I think that's all part of, of the demystification, Secretary Castro. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's so important. Yes, so your next question uh, is about Texas. Texas made big headlines yesterday when the census figures were released, gaining two congressional seats. How can the Latino community and other communities of color in Texas continue to build political power in the state to ensure that issues facing them are addressed by elected leaders? Uh, no, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, they did release that census, the initial census data yesterday and Texas grew a lot, uh, although not quite as, didn't get three congressional seats, I think it got two. And there's some question as to whether, because you saw this pattern of Arizona expecting to get a congressional seat, but not getting one, mm -hmm. Florida expecting to get one more than they actually did, and Texas expecting to get one more than they did, whether there was a you know systemic undercount of mm -hmm. Latinos in the United States. And we'll have a better sense of that when fuller data comes out in a couple of months. Uh, but assuming these are the numbers that we're going to uh, work with, there's still a tremendous growth in, in, you know, black and brown communities here in Texas and the Asian American community, which has grown fast. And what I'm encouraged about is the coalition building that has been going on for the last few years. There are a number of different organizations that are organizing now in Texas. They're still not at the scale, I think, that we need for a state as big as Texas, and hopefully they'll be better funded in the future to ramp up their scale. But getting people engaged in the things that impact their lives each and every day. You know, I grew up in San Antonio at a time when an organization called Cops Metro was still near its height of power. And Cops Metro was basically an old Alinsky model organization that um, was grassroots, that organized through the churches of San Antonio uh, on the west side, south side, and east side of the city. And its focus in the beginning really was about things that impacted people every day. Your street's not paved. When it rains, you know, your house gets flooded because you, you, the city hasn't invested in drainage. There's no, uh, you know, street light there. Uh, so, you know, your neighborhood is dark but things that people can, can really feel and touch and try to change and they can see progress on immediately. And then it, it expanded to things like investing in job training and higher education and so forth. But what I took from that is we always need to stay close to, to the people and what people's everyday concerns are mm -hmm. and ground our organizi organizing in that. And I'm happy that there is organizing going on in the Valley of Texas in places like Harris County that is very diverse in my hometown and others. If that continues, as it continues, then uh, what's gonna happen is that this, in very short order, this state is gonna be competitive, basically a swing state. It's almost there already. Uh, Barack Obama lost it by 16 points in 2012. Uh, Hillary lost it by nine points in 2016 and Biden lost it by five and a half points in 2020. And so, I mean, you can clearly see the trend, um, but we're gonna have to keep organizing and organizing around what people, you know, what affects their lives. Thank you. So we have time for one more audience question and then I will ask you a final question. Um, can, you, can you describe your experience on the campaign trail? You must have spoken with thousands of people, asked and answered thousands of questions, now, more than a year later, what are your greatest takeaways from that experience? My greatest takeaway, well, first, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, there's nothing else like it, uh, getting to see the country. Um, the thing that, one of the things I've always loved about uh, being in politics and public service was that it gives you a license to hear from people of all different backgrounds and and to not just meet them, to, but to hear about their aspirations for their community, the country, 
uh, and to feel like you might be able to make a difference. Um, my two biggest takeaways were number one, whether people were liberal or conservative, they really wanted to focus on solutions. Uh, as much as we see the infighting on cable news all the time, and sometimes I'm part of it on MSNBC or CNN, really most people are not that, like uber political, you know? Um, and sure, the people that would show up at a town hall, you know, for a Democratic primary were certainly more political than, than most. But still, what I could tell is that people really, okay, what got their attention was, well, how are you going to solve that problem? Mm. And, and I, I just offer that as a piece of advice to anybody that's thinking about getting into politics at any level is even if you have to do or you do, you know, the, the more fiery stuff or, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the back and forth that goes with partisanship, always, always understand that you should have at the ready what your substantive solution is. For, for problems in people's lives. And then the second part was that the person who wins the nomination and who ultimately wins the presidency really is the person that meets the moment the most. Mm. And uh, I think that Joe Biden met the moment. What people wanted was they saw this chaos in Trump and this neophyte that had not really had the requisite experience on top of a lot of, a lot of other issues that he had, but they wanted somebody that they kind of knew and trusted like okay things are going to be okay mm -hmm. you know this this guy we know him uh he was successful with barack obama um things are going to be okay if you turn it back over to this guy mm -hmm. uh and to his credit i mean joe biden did a spectacular job in the campaign but he also met the moment mm -hmm. uh, of what people were looking for okay thank you for answering that question so we only have about one and a half minutes left. I'm going to try to squeeze two questions into our <laughs> yeah, I'll be fast. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, what would you say to folks who are um, joining us today and who are wondering what they can do to advance racial justice and equity in their own work? And then finally, Secretary Castro, what gives you hope in this moment? Yeah, on the first question, uh, number one, uh, find the courage in, in the little moments every day. A lot of times when you're trying to advance racial justice equity, you know, it's not always in grand moments, it's in little moments, in a meeting, uh, in an exchange, uh, in decisions about programming or about something, resources or something else. And it takes courage oftentimes to speak up um, about it, but, uh, wherever you can find that courage, find that courage. Know that there are a lot of people thinking what you're thinking oftentimes that aren't voicing it. But if you voice it, you open up that gate for others to do it. Um, and that, and then find, find a way to mentor other people that are coming up behind you when you can. Um, and, and give them, provide help provide them with that same courage. Uh, in terms of what gives me hope, uh, well, I mean, I'm hopeful these days because I, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, right, of this pandemic, but also for kind of what I mentioned earlier is that I really believe that there's a stronger coalition right now of Americans of different backgrounds who see that this Reagan era, only small government, government's always bad, no more taxes and, you know, just get off my back. And we saw a lot of that here in Texas, of course. I think that that era is coming to an end, that this pandemic has accelerated that. That is an opportunity to bring about this uh, vision of living with dignity for everybody, to close those gaps in equity, uh, to make sure that everybody has a real shot at a good quality of life and real opportunity. And especially for people of color that uh, have struggled for so long and have sacrificed. Uh, and during this pandemic, particularly the last year, have often been the frontline workers and uh, have had worse health outcomes and have been hit the hardest. It's exciting that we might have, you know, uh, brothers and sisters of every background that are ready to say, hey, there's a different way to do this and we can create a better America. Um, if we have faith in one another and we invest in one another. There's a glimmer of hope of that right now that I haven't seen in a while. 
Well, that is a perfect note to end on. And on behalf of Lumina Foundation and everyone who joined us for this conversation today, Secretary Castro, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Have a great afternoon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.